Hello and welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MS Pierce. This is a Ukraine war frontline update for the 24th of March 2023. Before we get to the frontline, let's dip into just for a, a little while the ISW preamble. It uh, provides at the beginning of its daily report. There's some interesting stuff to share. Uh, Wagner Group financier Prigozhin, a lot to be said about him. I spoke about him in my news uh, video this morning, has softened his rhetoric toward the Russian Ministry of Defence, likely out of fear of completely losing his mercenary force in Bakhmut. Uh, there's talk about him possibly phasing out activities in Russia, maybe concentrating on uh, you know, continuing activities in Africa. Uh, Prigozhin denied the Kremlin's claims that Russia is fighting NATO in Ukraine and questioned whether there are actually Nazis in Ukraine, as the Kremlin constantly claims. This is very interesting, I find. Prigozhin stated that Russia is fighting exclusively with Ukrainians. Quote, that's a direct quote. And that's really important because there have been so many claims from Russian propagandists that there are Polish, you know, Polish NATO fighters, not just sort of international legion uh, mercenary or volunteer or whatever they want to call them, but actual NATO fight, uh, European NATO fighters fighting in Ukraine. And that's obviously nonsense. But here, Prigozhin is, is saying they are fighting exclusively with Ukrainians who are equipped with NATO provided equipment and some Russophobic mercenaries, we, we pro Ukrainians will say volunteers who voluntarily support Ukraine, which is an interesting verbiage here. So mercenaries who volunteer. So they're not mercenaries if they volunteer, but that could be the ISW uh, language there. But not NATO itself. Prigozhin also noted that Russian officials most likely knew that NATO would offer Ukraine military aid because, quote, it is ridiculous to think that when Russia decided to conduct its, this special military operation, it did not account for NATO's help to Ukraine. Prigozhin noted that he is unsure about the denazification objectives in Ukraine because he does not know if there are Nazis in Ukraine. Prigozhin also noted that Russia will demilitarize Ukraine only when all of Ukrainian military is destroyed, claiming that the, the this effort is ongoing, but that it is in unclear if it will be successful. Really um, candid remarks here from Prigozhin. Bloomberg reported that Prigozhin is preparing to scale back Wagner's operations in Ukraine after the Russian military leadership succeeded in cutting key supplies of personnel and munitions, citing unspecified people familiar with the matter. So the MOD Russia has disallowed Prigozhin and Wagner from being able to recruit convicts in the prisons, it seems. Uh, and without that fresh supply of people uh, into Wagner, they are going to struggle to maintain activities in Ukraine at the levels that they have been doing with the losses they have been taking. Without that, there is no real future for, for Wagner in Ukraine. But the way they're operating at the moment, unless they want to use their more elite troops as their frontline troops uh, in that attritional sense, which they, they're not going to want to do, then they need fresh supplies of um, of troops to to send in their vanguard. And yeah, it's just too difficult for them. Uh, a Ukrainian intelligence official supported ISW's prior assessments that Russian forces are unable to conduct large scale simultaneous offensive campaigns on multiple axes. So, if we are looking at the the map of Ukraine at the moment and the the front lines, it has been quite. Yesterday was super quiet. Today is also quiet. There's not a lot happening. This is supposedly a time of Russian offensive. And it appears that they've completely culminated and there isn't too much to report. So this, so the Ukrainian intelligence are saying what the ISW has said, that it looks like there's some kind of combination. Russian forces may be shifting their missile strike tactics to focus on Ukrainian military facilities as over overall Russian missile strikes decrease, indicating the depletion of Russia's stocks of high-precision mis missiles. So something I've been saying for a long time, but there's also this shift away from the energy uh, infrastructure to directly hitting military targets as they realize that hitting energy infrastructure is not so important at uh, the end of of the winter. Okay, let's get to the opening sector of our frontline analysis, which is the northeast, Kupiansk to Svatova to Kremina. And we go to my map, Kupiansk is here, uh, and Svatova just down there to the south 
east. Uh, we're going to start up in the Hrani Kivka area. There has been repelled attacks all around there, as according to the ISW that says you know, all the usual places. But does mention Sinkiva, unsuccessful ground attacks near Sinkivka. Now, I have uh, said that Sinkivka is been in Ukrainian control for some time. Liman Pershi may well be contested, uh, so I've got it in a grey zone. And I've said to Defmon, who's a pro-Ukrainian mapper, who's had Sinkivka under Russian control for ages, and I was questioning why he's the only mapper that does that. I questioned him directly. He didn't reply to me. But it's interesting now, having questioned him directly, Sinkivka, he's drawn his red line back behind there now. And indeed, Liman Pershi seems to be somewhat contested. And... Uh, uh, even going up further north, Rani Kivka is not fully under control of the Russians. So he's definitely re redrawn his maps in line with with pretty much all the other mappers. Uh, and really solid control only exists Tavoljanka down to Vilshana, Persia, Trivnevo. Uh, but anyway, he's saying that there's been a repelled attack in that uh, sector. Um, uh, repelled attack near Sinkiv because that's just drawing on what the ISW has said and the ISW then goes on to talk about Mikivka, Bilirivka, Verknoka, Miyansky, uh, and so on and so forth all the usual ones uh, that have been taking place but Sehi Cherovati who's the Eastern Group of uh, Forces spokesperson for Ukraine stated that Ukrainian forces have destroyed many pieces of ru new Russian equipment in the past several weeks as Russian forces use more conventional forces and armor vehicles in the Liman and Kupiansk direction. There have been there's been quite a lot of video evidence. Uh, the figures have been bad as well. Video evidence of destroyed Russian equipment and the figures have been shocking today. APCs were double figures over twenty, I think. APCs taken out in the Russians. Uh, tanks have, have really suffered over the last couple of weeks so it, it has been looking pretty uh dodgy for the russians um as i say usual names mentioned coming down here makivka uh, activity around there then you've got yempolivka sort of region torska and whatnot uh, uh as we can see from the isw uh we're going to go to no reports now who's got something to say about Kremlin area I, in Kremlin, I received confirmation that, so he claimed two days ago, then he's got confirmation now, that Ukrainian troops have indeed pushed Russian troops north of Dobrova back, what, 500 to 1,000 metres. Large-scale Russian attacks remain out of the last 48 to 72 hours. So in other words, they haven't been attacking that time. Local skirmishes in the Kremlin forest. The Ukrainians have averted an attack on Bilirivka. So they've repelled an attack in, on the Bilirivka area. Now, this is interesting. So they, no other mapper has this, but he, he seems as adamant in our reports and has talked to his contacts to suggest that basically this whole uh, Ukraine, uh, Russian salient here, the actual line would be something like back there. And that the, the Russians have been pushed back uh, by the Ukrainians. Uh, and th that would be interesting. I'm not changing my maps, but I, I recognize that that could well have happened. Um, but no one else has said that as explicitly as no reports, but it w wouldn't surprise me if indeed the Ukrainians had pushed back the Russians in that area. Um, but these, these sort of things are often give and take. So, you know, one day it'll be a pushback here another day it'll be pushed forward over there and, uh, and whatever. Um, Bilirivka, there's been uh, some activity around there, repelled attack as no report said, uh, deep state map, uh, has changed mapping here to have more Russian control, but actually still less Russian control that I have. Mine was based on Suryak maps, who are quite generous in this area to Russia. So it could be that the Russian line at Deep State has it looking something like that. Uh, and uh, I think it might be slightly different around here as well. It might not be so far forward around there. So it, it might look something like that. It depends which map it, you go to. But uh, that's that's how I, I've got it. Um, just always take my claims with a pinch of salt, as, as one should take everyone's. And then there's uh, activity around Verknokomyansk uh, as well. Um, repelled attacks there. Apparently, if we go to Defmon... Uh, then he says the AFU uh, repelled attacks around the area of Bilirivka uh, and Verknokomyanska. I've adjusted the line like 100 meters in uh, Russian favor in the Bilirivka area. I think it's the most change I've done there in the last few months. And then it's on to um, Bakhmut again. 
uh, getting there fairly quickly these days because there's not a huge amount of activity going on in, in many areas. Right. Uh, if we go to the ISW, uh, they say Ukrainian ground forces, uh, Syrsky stated that Wagner Group elements remain the main Russian force operating in the Bakhmut direction and that they have not yet lost their offensive capabilities. So although they talk about Wagner, uh, you know, struggling to recruit uh, and let's talk about VDV and other regular Russian forces supplanting them in and around Bakhmut. There is this assertion that no, Wagner are still the main force there. Sursky noted that while Wagner forces still have the numerical advantage on the front, front line, uh, Ukrainian forces continue to exhaust the mercenaries, which will enable Ukrainian forces to pursue unspecified future offensive operations. I find this uh, important because, and there's lots of argument around what is going on in Bakhmut and what has been taking place. Some people are claiming that the stasis on the front line in Bakhmut uh, ha is a vindication of Sursky and Zelensky and other people's decision to remain defending Bakhmut. So, for example, Phillips O'Brien here says, just a few weeks ago, many were going out of their way to criticize Sursky, uh, say his tactics were going to bleed the Ukrainians too much and lose Bakhmut as well. He is taking those criticisms head on, and his critics have fascinatingly gone very quiet. Uh, and this is he's sort of referring to the Kiev independence, says Ukraine will soon take advantage of Russian troops fatigue in Bakhmut. Ukrainian forces in Bakhmut are preparing to take advantage of Russian forces' massive losses and fatigue, uh, says Sursky. Now, this is the idea, uh, I guess, that if you successfully exhaust the Russian forces here such that they culminate, not just culminate, I mean, they, they are fundamentally weakened, then this will potentially allow you to uh, to put in a counterattack near there. So it could be that this would be a really good place to counterattack because it won't be heavily mined, it won't be heavily defensively fortified because this is where the Russians have been on the attack. And they are fundamentally weakened here, uh, fatigued and lost so many troops, so the theory would go, that actually if you punch through here and through there, you could operationally encircle, that's the worst drawing I've done, you could uh, operationally encircle the Russians here. And this is what uh, Prigozhin was talking about as one of the three um, actions that the, Rus the Ukrainians could do in this more northerly sector. Uh, that that could be something to consider. I've never really thought that Bakhmut would be an area for the Ukrainians to bother with a counter-offensive because I think there are better strategic options or operational uh, options for them. But actually, it's, you know, there is an element of adaptation that, that you need on when you're doing warfare so that if, if something comes up, you can react to that and adapt your your strategy or your tactics or whatever to to fit in line with with new data and it could be that now you've got a significantly weakened russian uh, force here that is not defensively mined minded and mined uh, and so this would present itself a really good uh op opportunity you know if you're being opportunistic to to take advantage of so that that could be that could be an option and so anyway Going back to here, so Phillips O'Brien was saying, well, you know, these decisions have been vindicated. And then people like Tatarigami saying, no, absolutely not. So he says, yes, sarcastically, the perfect strategy. Keep your forces trapped in an operative encirclement. Continue losing doctors and experienced troops attempting to enter or leave a city located in lowlands. And then use reserves intended for a different offensive to break encirclement. So you can be praised by as a Bakhmut saviour. But actually, so I'm not going to read you all of this, but because this thread has got some really interesting arguments going both ways. So some people, and some people sitting on a fence saying, the answer is nobody really knows. We just don't know enough information. So he says, it's possible that Ukrainian general staff is making a mistake. You could even argue that it's likely, but to argue that they're both committing an error and that it is resulting in a major strategic defeat, you don't know that. Uh, not that he actually said that, as he says, but 
yeah, they talk about looking at the topographic map and actually Bakhmut being in the in the lowlands here it means that it's it's not a great place to defend. If you were to step back and defend Chesiv Yar uh, and some of these places on the higher ground to the west of Bakhmut, actually you you do a better job of defending, and it wouldn't be as so attritional as Bakhmut has been. But then the counter argument was would be that yeah, but would the Russians have lost as many troops as they have lost in trying to take Bakhmut? Uh, and then other people say, well, no, but then they could have. Treated, they could have withdrawn two weeks ago rather than, you know, it's not about giving up back from it straight away, but it's about finding the optimal time to retreat. And many people are saying that that time's passed. But then others are now saying, well, now it looks like the Russians are exhausted. So uh, maybe this is a good idea. Anyway, the arguments are rife. That's a really good thread of Tatragami fighting his corner. Other people saying all sorts of very interesting thread that I could actually spend some, some decent time on. Right. If we go to Kenneth Gregg. And again, not 100% sure how reliable this guy is, but it does sometimes give some interesting viewpoints and does have a few sources. So he's this Swedish-Finnish fighter uh, that's in in um, Ukraine. Don't know he's in Bakhmut at the moment. The title for today is That's It for the Russians. Around Kremlin, we hold the positions without problems, and in Bakhmut, we have finally started to push the Russians away from the center and south of Ivanivska. On Deep State Map, the forest area south of Ivaniska is still marked as under the control of the Russians. But the latest news from our boys in the area is that the Russians have been driven out and onto the open ground. If we want to be careful, we can say the area is grey. OK, let's have a look at that. So going here to the southern area, we have, and our mine is, my map still has this, so let's zoom out a little bit. You've got Bakhmut City Centre, you've got the T0504 road coming in, which the Ru Russians have been pushed back from over the last uh, week, I guess. Now, he is saying that the Ukrainians have pushed the Russians out of the forest area there, but you could say that that's now a, um, a grey zone. But interesting if that is indeed true. He continues, we have, uh, of course, hard fighting, but the Russians are now being driven back on all fronts around Bakhmut. Even south of Nova Bakhmutivka, we have attacked and advanced in order to flank the Russians' 136th Motorized Rifle Brigade. We are advancing between them and the 3rd Brigade, Berkut. Uh, this is now the first time we counterattacked on this part of the front. So that's going down towards uh, Avdivka. Uh, so on and so forth. I'll get to Abdivka a little bit later, um, but I that is, that is pretty interesting. Okay, let's go back to the ISW. Uh, ISW says Russian sources also claim that Russian forces have completely cleared the industrial zone in northern Bakhmut and are continuing to fight in central and southern Bakhmut. So this is then going back against uh, what some of the claims of Kenneth Runtar, uh, Kenneth Gregg, sorry, that the Russians are being pushed back everywhere. You've got Russian claims saying that the entire kind of metal works here uh, is now sort of under the control of the Russians, or they've cleared the Ukrainians out from there. Uh, ISW then continues, geolocated footage posted on March the 22nd, that's two days ago, remember, showed, and I don't get this, again, I've checked this, and I'll explain that in a second, this, this footnote, showed Ukrainian forces engaging nearby Russian forces on the western bank of the Bakhmatyvka River uh, with small arms, which likely indicates that some Russians have forded the river. And it says, uh, footnote 30, and it gives two, uh, two references on footnote 30. So let's go and look at the map. So the Bakhmatyvka or Bakhmatyvka River, um, is this one that comes down here. So he's saying that some Russian forces have forded the river there and uh, there is fighting on the western bank. And the reference it gives, oddly, well not oddly so far, the reference it gives is, is this video in a couple of places, both here and on Telegram. And he, there's a geolocation to that which is there. OK, uh, this is apparently just on the west bank of the uh, the river. One would assume this is on the west bank of, of the river and it's being attacked by Ukrainians here using ATGMs to, to leather this building. Right. So all the video is, is that building getting hit repeatedly by uh, ATGM fired from another building across the way. OK. But when you do a geolocation of that, it ends up being here. Right, so this is where that building is. Is nowhere near the Bakhmutivka River. That's a building that's getting hit. Obviously, 
being shot from the Ukrainian area to the north there. So this has nothing to do with the Bakhmatifka River over there. So in other words, I don't know. I That claim seems to be bogus to me or somewhat, somewhat incorrect or they've got the wrong references or something. So I don't know that the river has been forwarded. At least they haven't provided the correct evidence for that claim. Anyway, I just thought I'd, I'd clear that up. Um, now, if we go to a pro-Russian source, Rebar says, and I've not told you what they've said about the Kupiansk area, but they have said that they've increased, Russians have increased area of control around Ploshchanka. I've got no other evidence of that. And they're talking about fighting on the outskirts of Makivka. I think that's actually two days old now. And it's a tank that was blown up. And I showed you footage of that two days ago. It could have even been three days ago now. Uh, so I'm not sure that that's, that's particularly uh, timely. As far as Bakhmut's concerned, it, Battle of Bakhmut is still underway. In the north of the city, Wagner PMC assault groups are controlling a large part of the metal processing plant. So now they're saying a large part. Is that more than 50%? Less is that like a 40%? A large part, of, if I ate a large part of the cake, that could be anywhere from like 30% to like 90%, okay? So really vague. Um, nice use of cake, I guess. Uh, at the same time, an offensive also develops in the southern districts where intense street battles are reported, but no talk about change of, of territory there. So pretty vague um, for uh, Bakhmut there. Now, I'm going to show you a bit of footage. This is from uh, New World Economics War Reports has, has shared a video. Uh, this is, I'm not seeing lots of craters from artillery. It's possible that most of these vehicles were hit by direct fire. Interesting. Anyway, this is a video of driving, I believe, uh, in the area. So just to let you know, I think it's going to be in these kind of roads between the two tarmac roads, the two asphalt roads here. It's going to be in these mud roads there. And it shows just a, a whole host of equipment that's been blown up. These will all be Europe, U, sorry, Ukrainian bits of equipment. But you'll notice they're mainly SUVs. And actually, when you see people like No Reports uh, and other, uh, quite a number of different uh, Dimitri, I think, War Translated, a lot of people doing fundraising for the forces. It's quite often fundraising for these uh, these vehicles, these kind of pickup trucks. Um, the reason is because they don't always last that long, as you can see here. It's interesting because these aren't so much military vehicles, although they are almost certainly vehicles that have been used by the military. Um, and then th you can just see how difficult it is to get. I mean, that's a temporary bridge that's had to be erected. Um, vehicles sort of littering all over the place that have been hit uh, but as he says, not too many craters. So, you know, what is exactly hitting these? Well, it's got to be pretty, pretty precise uh, hits to uh, to take out these vehicles if they're moving with artillery. And I don't know that Russians particularly have that kind of precision artillery usage so much. But um, anyway, that's the kind of uh, environment that that Bakhmut is, or at least the outskirts of Bakhmut. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, I guess the only thing to say again is another uh, relatively quiet or very quiet uh, day in the Bakhmut area that has not seen any uh, change of territory. There might arguably be uh, some Ukrainian gains in the southwest. Uh, and again, who who does this who does this better um, better help? Or does this indicate who is doing better in the area? I'd say Ukraine. So it does honestly look like Russia are struggling to maintain that momentum and initiative there. Uh, but I, I guess we'll see over the next couple of days and it'll be interesting to see whether there are considerable reinforcements being piled into Bakhmut by the, the Ukrainians. If they do hold on to this. So this is, and someone mentioned this in that thread I was referring to. Don't under, so when we talk about, oh, it's just a political victory. Right, is it a, oh, sorry, a political decision? So when, like the the criticism, is Zelensky's made a political decision, and it's a political decision to keep hold of Bakhmut. Don't just think that's just a shite decision, because actually the, there is there is an argument to be made that yes, it's a political and not tactical or operational decision to maintain Bakhmut. But if Russia failed to take Bakhmut with the might of the Russian army. After eight months, if they actually fail that from a political point of view, that is a huge loss to Russia and to the morale of the troops and to and politically and domestically back in Russia. So it might, though you might be sacrificing troops for that political gain, 
It is a significant political gain that could actually play into the larger narrative that has a really important utility. So it's really easy to be dismissive of political decisions on the battlefield. But just be wary, because if Ukraine maintain control of over Bakhmut, that political victory could be incisive. Anyway, I just think it's worth worth throwing that one in there. Right, let's go down. I have too much banging on. Let's go down to Avdivka and have a look and see what's going there, particularly in Nova Bakhmutivka. We've heard about that from Kenneth Gregg and then Krasnoharivka and then Avdivka itself. I'm going to go back to uh, Kenneth Gregg, who says, um, just going to get rid of some of these tabs, uh, says about that area. Um, so even south of Novobak Mativka, we have attacked and advanced in order to flank the Russians. We are advancing between them and the 3rd Brigade Burkut. This is now the first time we counterattack on this part of the front. So that would suggest an attack south of uh, Novobak Mativka. I don't know whether that is there and whether they'll try to get some kind of encirclement going or to try and cut them off uh, as, a, as they are working their way westwards of Krasnoharivka. Um, but again, this is Kenneth Gregor. I don't know how reliable this is. Avdivka is also out of danger for the moment. We have new and well-equipped troops here as well. The only place where the grey zone has expanded a bit is west of Krasna Harivka. In, uh, and then he goes on to talk about something else, which I'll come to a little bit later. So that is uh, that is very interesting. Um, uh, if we go to the ISW, yeah. Uh, they say Russian sources claim that Russian artillery established fire control over the Ukrainian supply route via Olivka. Uh, Olivka is here, so that there's a, that's an important supply route. You can see that there are several roads coming in out there, so that's quite a key hub. And the claim is that Russian have fire control over that with their artillery, uh, which you know they would be able to hit that for sure. Uh, how much consistent fire control they have, I don't know. Um, Russian sources claim that Russian forces cleared the western outskirts of Novobakhmutivka and continued to advance on Povomysky and Siverny. I'll show you that in a second from the south. Another Russian source expressed doubt that Russian forces captured Novobakhmutivka and Stepova and noted that Russian forces are also fighting for Kamyanka. A Russian source claimed that it's too early to speculate about Russian efforts to create a cauldron around Avdivka and about operational successes in the area. So there's a whole mixed bag of what the Russians are saying about what's going on here uh, and what the limits of their success have been. A Russian mill blogger claimed that Russian forces advanced near Novokalinove and reached an unspecified elevated position in the area. Russian sources also claimed that elements of the 200th separate motor rifle brigade attacked Tonenke. So uh, there's a few new uh, place names there. Tonenke is here and that is um, a pretty uh, important for the Ukrainians to hold that, obviously, Sivyani as well, because once they go, you, you really are closing the net in on Avdivka. Now, there has been, I talked about, uh, I showed you video footage of, of lots of equipment, mechanized equipment being absolutely hammered here. So, whether the Russians actually have control of this or whether this is more effectively a gray zone, I'd say that's probably a gray zone there. If the artillery is really uh, hammering, you know, any kind of Russian movement there. There has been Suryat maps, a pro-Russian map, the only map they updated yesterday, although they did say they're going to be a bit quieter till the end of March, um, is, is this one, which is a situation... Uh, southwest of Donetsk, uh, sorry, situation west of Donetsk City. During the last 48 hours, Russian forces managed to capture new areas in Povomysky adjacent to the Izmailivsky Pond, uh, which is this one there. So they've captured a little bit more. I've reflected that in my mapping as well. But actually, interestingly, by giving them a bit, a bit of, uh, um, a bit of a, a gain there, sorry. I've taken away some as well. So just updating my maps. So that's actually not, yeah, they've gained some here, but uh, but I've recorded them as losing some just north of, northwest of there. So anyway, that's what's going on in Avdivka. Rebar says um, of Avdivka, they have a whole separate sort of, uh, this is the only thing they've got on Twitter. They've got their map talking about, you know, fighting west of Krasnohirivka, but as they also indicate they are not past the railway line coming in there, which the, the claims the other day were that they were pretty much taking over Stepova. Now that I don't think they're past that railway line, no one, everyone seems to have redrawn their maps 
back for the Russians there. And this claims that there's uh, advances for the Russians by Nova Bakhmativka, but Kenneth Gregg says actually there's a counterattack by the Rus the Ukrainians there, so I don't know, who knows. Uh, north of Avdivka says Rebar Pro Russian source, soldiers of the 132nd Separate Guards Motorized Rifle Brigade and Russian Armed Forces have advanced west of Nova Bak Bakhmativka in recent days, completely clearing the settlement of AFU presence. So that, that is very explicit that there is no presence for the Ukrainians in Nova Bakhmativka. South of there and northeast of Krasnoharivka, Russian units are built on their success by driving out Ukrainian formations from two strongholds. And this is a this is where it seems that Kenneth Gregg saying there's actually a Ukrainian counterattack there. Now the Ukrainians hold positions in the forest belt near one of the sections of the H-20 highway uh, and are in a semi-encirclement. So that's going to be there. Uh, northwest of Avdivka, positional battles near the railway continue after the sortie of the Russian armed forces in, Petr uh, in Petrivska. The AFU transferred, uh, it's going to be uh, step of a, uh, reserves and force the Russian military personnel over the railway line. So that, that was the retreat, the redrawing of the lines back behind the railway line. So that's what's going on in Avdivka. It appears that the the front lines have somewhat stabilized after this very relatively quick um, gain of territory for the Russians in, in the north there towards Krasnoharivka. Uh, the Ukrainians have uh, defend, started to defend those positions um, Effectively. And then when we come further down south to Marenka, there's just claims in the ISW of fighting in Marenka and Pobieda. Uh, nothing much to report. And even Vukladar appears to be very quiet as well. If we go there, Russian forces continue in the ISW, uh, continue conducting offensive operations west of Donetsk, but have not resumed offensives near Vukladar. So that's according to, uh, I presume, the general staff. The general staff of the Ukraine reported that Russian forces unsuccessfully attacked Marian Kampobieda. But then there are claims that 155th Naval Infantry Brigade, so they're one of the ones that have been decimated and reconstituted three times, the Marines operating in Vukhodar, are continuing to combat to continuing combat missions in the vicinity of Vukhodar and recently posted footage that could be several days old uh, from the area indicating that Russian and Ukrainian forces are engaged in positional battles uh, near Vukhodar. So basically not moving much, just lobbing uh, different munitions at each other. Uh, and that's that area. So significantly quieter in Marienka and Vukladar. It's not to say there isn't fierce fighting around Marienka, I'm sure. Um, uh, and stabilization in Abdivka and indeed Bakhmut. Uh, so really a, a relatively quiet day compared to what it has been. Uh, apparently some activity south of Orkiv, I think. Uh, another mill blogger claimed on March 23rd that Ukrainian forces conducted counteroffensive operations in a Roboturny uh, direction. So this is just south of Orokhiv there. Uh, and there was a, a Ukrainian reconnaissance in force unit that was pretty much taken out on the way uh, to Roboturny. So there still could be activity for the Ukrainians around there. Otherwise, it's uh, a case of going down to Kherson and seeing what's happening there and just uh, a few bits in the ISW concerning activity going in and around the river area, uh, the Veliki Potemkin Island south of there, there's um, Russians are striking Ukrainian forces operating there, geolocated footage showing Ukrainian drones hassling the Russians, so it's the usual sort of activity in that area. Uh, that's the uh, basically the end of the uh, frontline update hopefully that was useful informative please like subscribe and share really appreciate that um uh, and thank you for supporting the channel uh, and i will catch up with you later in the ukraine war update extra video